Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Easy Conversations podcast, a podcast about having easy conversations. This podcast is in partnership with Evergreen Podcasts. And every week we dive into the topics of mental health, adversity, spirituality, and societal issues. I'm your host, Furkan Dandia. And in this week's episode, I sit down with Matt Gerlach. Matt shares his journey from accidental entrepreneurship in 2017 to the discovery and healing of deep-seated childhood trauma. Struggling with anxiety and stress, and even experiencing panic attacks, Matt sought help and uncovered unresolved issues from his past that affected his self-worth. Despite growing his business to a million-dollar venture annually, he speaks about the struggles he faced growing up, including his contentious relationship with his father, being forced into sports, and feeling out of place due to his sensitivity and sexuality. Matt's story emphasizes the importance of acknowledging one's worth, the pitfalls of living from a place of scarcity, and the ongoing journey of growth and healing. Matt is more than just an entrepreneur and author. He's a conqueror of challenges and a beacon of personal transformation. With an unwavering belief in the inherent wisdom within each of us, He guides his clients to unearth their inner strength and conquer the barriers blocking their path to success. Matt skilled his business to generate an impressive $1 million in annual revenue, and he works one-on-one with high achievers who grapple with self-doubt, illuminating the truth that there's nothing inherently flawed within them and empowering them to embrace their true selves. I really hope you get a lot out of this episode. Please check out the ways you can find Matt online. And before we jump into the episode today, Here's a brief word for our sponsors. Today's episode is also sponsored by BetterHelp. Therapy can be very difficult for many people to start. In my personal experience, when I was going through my divorce, therapy allowed me to bridge a significant gap. With the help and support of my therapist, I was able to uncover a lot of repeated patterns and behaviors that were impacting my life. Through goal setting, I was able to focus on things that required attention, which allowed me to improve the relationship that I had with myself and by extension, the relationship that I had with others. As a therapist, I've been able to see the positive benefits that clients are able to derive through healthy rapport and goal setting. BetterHelp allows a lot of flexibility where clients can schedule video sessions, sessions on the phone, or through messaging. In most cases, BetterHelp will match you up with a licensed therapist within 48 hours. If that's not a good fit for you, BetterHelp will work with you to find the right fit. Join over 4 million users today by following the link in the description or going to BetterHelp, that's H-E-L-P, betterhelp.com slash EZ10 to get 10% off your first month of therapy. Matt, how are you today? I'm doing fantastic. How are you? Okay, doing good. Thanks. Uh, Thanks for joining me today on the show. I'm really excited to have this conversation and explore with you some of the things you've shared. Uh, Like I said, looking forward to it. But uh, just to give us an idea, do you mind getting into a little bit about yourself and sharing with the listeners who you are and what's brought you here today? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm happy to be here as well. So thanks for having me. I'm an entrepreneur. I would say almost accidental a bit. And my story is in about, it was about 2017, I started a consulting business and it it was random. I fell into this baby product sales market when I moved to New York in 2010. And it, it, it normal, good business, nothing really too, I'm nothing really too exciting about it, I would say. And I started this consulting business. I wanted to get out of being an employer. I started my business, really started having a lot of stress. I knocked my blood pressure, gave start medication. And I just really was feeling anxious and depressed because Mm -hmm. of the stress that I was under. And it started to get disruptive to my life. I started having panic attacks. I said, I actually wound up in the hospital two times thinking I was having a heart attack Mm -hmm. and sent me down a path of 
uncovering what was going on. And I realized after many doctor visits, I finally ended up in a neurologist's office and he said, Matt, I've seen it a million times. He was like the rudest guy ever. So it's even funnier. He was <laughs> like, don't ever come back here. You don't need me. This is plain old anxiety and go see your therapist or go see your, go see somebody else. Don't waste mm-hmm. my what was liberating that it was liberating that I wasn't dying. That was great mm-hmm. news, but I was already in therapy. I was already in yoga, meditating, doing acupuncture. And so it meant doing more of the same things. And I continued down the path and realized that I had a childhood trauma that had not been realized that I had not acknowledged. And at the time I could have told you about my childhood in two paragraphs, mm-hmm. literally remember much. And so for the past seven, eight years now, I have been on a healing journey. I would consider myself nicely healed, but Mm -hmm. fully healed. I don't know that we're ever fully healed. I think when you're on a healing journey, like I'm on, it really, it turns into a growth journey Mm -hmm. and you start to learn the power and beauty and excitement and amazingness and ongoing forever growth and that's my story through my thing i actually grew my business to make myself a million dollars a year past few years Mm -hmm. which is remarkable i come from a very blue collar family i never thought this would be the case for me and really no one gave this to me it was me having to negotiate and advocate for myself and learn my worth i have always been a stellar employee a stellar you know contributor to society Mm -hmm. And I didn't know what I was worth. And I really care a lot about equality and about cost of living is just absolutely insane. Even a million dollars <laughs> isn't um, not what it used to be. I don't want to sound like it's not, but just the cost of living is ridiculous high now. And I really yeah. believe that people need to understand their worth. And I mainly... I'm speaking to the high achievers out there that are, that are undervalued. Um, Mm -hmm. So yeah, through this journey, I started this business and it was really based off scarcity. I was very afraid that I would end up under a bridge living, not Mm -hmm. able to afford my life and don't recommend living your life driven by scarcity, but it was what it was. And now I've been called to purpose-driven work and want to help other people grow and Mm -hmm. learn what I. Yeah. Thank you for sharing all that. I appreciate it. So there's many ways I want to go about this because you've touched on childhood trauma. You've touched on worth. You've touched on scarcity. So I want to tie it all together. And you and I have also chatted. So I have bit of an understanding of what potentially was leading to that childhood trauma or some of those patterns that you were perhaps encountering uh, as an adult that were coming back and leading to that anxiety as you described it. But let's touch on the worth because that sounds like something that you've tried to heal. And how does that relate to your childhood? I just always thought something was wrong with me. Growing up, I like I was always a sensitive kid and I hated sports and I still hate sports. I will go to a Super Bowl party for the food. I enjoy the food. I don't mind watching a little bit of it. I'm exaggerating now, but like Mm -hmm. I, my parents had me in sports thinking that would be good for me. I showed no talent whatsoever (laughs) and um, I hated it. I just hated everything about it. And so that really made me feel like something was wrong with me and big risk with my family because I was so uncooperative. Um, at school, I did not fit in and I'm gay. And around fifth grade, I had a group of guy friends, boyfriend, not boyfriend, got male friend. Yeah. And they realized something was different about me. I was realizing something was different about me and they abandoned me. Don't say that they're kids. That happens. I'm not saying they were that they ruined my life, <laughs> but I, um, I was so shameful that I hid this. I don't think that anyone really knew. 
that this was the case for me. And I just covered it up and held it all inside. And honestly, like it was, I'm 41 years old almost right now. It was like, I, I'm writing a book about my journey of healing and I'm working with the writing coach. And it was like, I remember maybe three years ago that I had a really hard time, like even confessing to her about the shame and just like the devastation that I felt. So I was what, 10, 11 years old and I held it in for 25 years. So school was really difficult for me. I was, I've always been intelligent and smart. So I did academically, but I literally didn't have a single friend for four years of my entire fifth grade through ninth grade. Never one invited to a birthday party, went home after school every day, going to a friend's house. And I acted out because of it. There was a lot going on at home, a lot of overwhelming chaos in the house. And I acted out and I was punished for it. And just, I just continued to believe more and more that something was wrong with me. And I have compassion for, I have compassion for parents that have mm -hmm. kids who are acting out. I think especially back then, I think we didn't know that, that we need to, when a kid's acting out, generally, I'm not an expert on this, but I would imagine an expert would agree that there's probably something deeper than them. Mm -hmm misbehaving bad child and I, and I was but at the same time I was extremely helpful I did mm -hmm. or a lot of it was self-regulation or regulation if I needed something to do to keep myself from feeling miserable and mm -hmm. started helping my parents my grandparents and doing like adult chores cleaning massive cleaning projects mowing the lawn for the neighbors, helping them pay bills, just really adult things. I didn't really have a child for it at all. I, part of that was like, I never really, I was just different. I didn't really play with toys. And now it's very funny because like it was seven, eight years ago. Like I remember thinking I had no hobby, like literally <laughs> it wasn't, but um, I had no hobbies. Now if I look at myself. I haven't been bored in five years. Like I, mm -hmm. I could hours and hours. I cook, I garden, I practice yoga, I work out, which is just so funny. I'm probably like the most athletic in my family, but it, it's not from competitive sports. Right. I, I hike, I run, I go to the gym, but uh, yeah, my story is not completely unique. Yeah. My, had trauma growing up that was never acknowledged and treated either. And I don't like, I didn't really know that mental health was a thing. Like growing up, I was, I had allergies so bad. I'd never seen anybody in my life like this. Literally I would like, I would, I go to school with, with my pocket, like mounds of tissues in there and just those red sneezing every 15 seconds for hours and then be sent home. I'd fall asleep at my desk sometimes because like I'd take bet like Benadryl or Dimetap at the time. And um, I've never seen anybody like this. And recently I had allergies. I don't really have them anymore. And I was like, oh my God, this is what, like 5% of what that was. And I felt like right. tired and fatigue. And I'm like, oh my God, like this was my life. I felt horrible. Mm -hmm. And I just, growing up, my dad always said, unless you're like, not the flu or something. There's just no reason to let that get on. I didn't know you were supposed to feel good. And mm -hmm. that really translated to my career. I graduated all it. I got a job at 15 and just worked mm -hmm. at mall, like mall jobs, the normal. And then mm -hmm. I got a hospital, like doing a super serious job. I was doing this during college, like during bodies, the morgue and watching heart monitors. And it was like, still even looking back, like, I wanted a heart I've ever had, but uh, yeah, like I just, I went from that and then I sold metal after college. You wouldn't imagine that metal is used for so much, but there's construction, yeah. meaning fabrication, crazy, but uh, a lot, it was a decent, nice people, but like, it was just like, who wants to sell metal when they're like, out of college? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I just really, in my whole life, like. Not ever 
like just thinking something was wrong with me. Like I looked around me at myself and I saw people at work who were happy and like mm -hmm. most of them were happy-ish. I mean, everyone would rather have it be a weekend than a weekday when you're, you know, when you're 20. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Feel as, as out of place as I did. And I just always thought something was wrong with me. And that really was the basis of the self-worth issue. I just, I mean, I literally like in my head, like now when I think back to the first, you know, 30 years of my life, just, I just always thought something was wrong with me. Mm -hmm. I was like when I was being punished, what's wrong with your, your, right. but uh, yeah, I, and it's weird. Like on the outside, like when this panic, like when this mental health situation of mine was at its worst, I looked really good on the outside. I see pictures of mm -hmm. myself. I'm like, I don't know. I wasn't eating like that much. And like, I was working out. But I looked good for a while. Mm -hmm. I was losing my hair. I see pictures mm -hmm. of myself. My hair was absolutely almost, almost gone from the stress mm -hmm. going through. But yeah, I think everybody thought that how bad could things be for Matt? And I thought, how bad could they be for me also? I, on the outside, mm -hmm. I, I looked fine. And I think a big part of the childhood trauma too was like, it's very difficult. I think when you have a horrendous experience, there is a general... It's a little easier, I think, to admit that was bad, but I grew up in a home with love. I grew up, you know, the house was very clean. There was always food on the table. There was Christmas gifts and there was a lot of chaos and stress and overwhelm and things that happened to kid to me as a kid that weren't appropriate. That yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, I appreciate that. And I think what you're describing there with the home life, very similar to, to your own adult life, like you said, on the surface, everything seems fine and great. But it's when you look below the hood, there's all this stuff happening that's not necessarily being dealt with or talked about. So I think that's where, unfortunately, that's where we function as a society too. And now you've added this layer of social media where People have these superficial lives. Everything looks great, but what's going on below the surface, we don't know. And it's easy to compare uh, based on the external metrics, and we tend to fall into that trap. And then with your childhood, you touched on, again, being forced to play sports and then having that abandonment issue with your friends. I think at the end of the day, whether you're a child or an adult, we all want to be seen and heard and understood and you weren't being heard or seen right you were being forced into sports your friends didn't understand you so they abandoned you so when we tend to act out as children that's what it is it's a call for help it's a call to be seen and understood and because we don't have the language or the understanding to be able to express ourselves that and and sometimes we don't even learn that as adults it's hard to be like, hey, mom and dad, I'm struggling here. I just want you to understand me or, or see me or help me out. We will act out and, and that's our way of getting attention, which doesn't help, right? And as parents, we tend to personalize it. That why is my child misbehaving? Why is he doing that? He must be a bad child, right? And trying to, rather than trying to understand, okay, what's going on? And like you said, it's a generational thing. We obviously have way more knowledge today so we can at least have a better understanding now i know you touched on your father and some of the things he would say to you especially as you were struggling with some of those allergy issues how was your relationship with your father and again this is contextual because you've shared some of that with me offline but how is how was that relationship and what have you been able to do as part of your healing work to improve that relationship. Yeah. Yeah. Just, I have to comment on the kid thing. I'm just yeah. like, I mean, I'm just like always shocked like, as an adult, yeah. reading something out and being like, God, like when you're like 10 years old, you have such a limited perspective mm -hmm. of the world. You literally, there's no possible way that any 10 year old has the, or even a 20 year old has the ability to know what people like you and I do now. And honestly, mm -hmm. when we're twice our age too, we're going to look back at us in our age that we're at now and think the same thing. Mm -hmm. 
my relationship with my father has been very contentious. I would say I love him and he's taught me a lot. He was very, he was very fiscally responsible and a big part of my success and in life and financial life is because of him because he taught me how to invest money so my, like my grandma always gave us money for christmas and he made me save a lot of it and invested some of it in stocks for us and it sucked being like 10 years old and, <laughs> you can't, you, you, but you can't yeah. but i mean it was the right thing to do yeah. really, again. on the same hand like there wasn't like the finance there's a lot of financial trauma that happened my parents were very fiscally responsible but they really set an example or at least the way that i interpreted it was like don't enjoy today very much save the money for tomorrow you never know what's coming that's probably been one of the biggest accomplishments in my life it's really been only the past like two and a half years that i've really just i get the picture of like diving like, i'm like diving off a cliff or something right now of just like really being able to enjoy my life mm -hmm. Saving response. And, enough, but. and do you feel that's where the scarcity also comes in from? Like well, I yeah. touched on. Yeah. And the thing was, my grandmother had money, and there was money. And this was like we weren't like poor, but we yeah. grew up. We were. We never went on an airplane as a family, or there was never. There was like yeah, very tight budget. And then there were things. There was a, there was money for things that the outside of our house was very beautiful. So there was money for new flowers in the spring, but like when it came to back to school shoes, it was like you just get one pair for the year, which isn't the worst thing. It goes deeper than the shoes. It's just there was just never extra money for anything. And mm -hmm. I get it, but it's just I'm at peace with it now. But sad. Mm -hmm. and, like I have friends that have kids now and they're like, oh, like we bought him this like Lego thing, and, like a Target on a Saturday just for no reason. Yeah, and generally like, we'll buy him something mm -hmm. like a week. And I'm like, oh my God. Yeah. There, that. There was never like any sort of, I don't want to say it was never provided, but it was just, if it was, I felt the stress of it like very much to the point mm -hmm. where like, the, you wouldn't ask for it. Because mm -hmm. would you, you would you would be very clear on what the sacrifice was, and my father, I love him, and I I'm not sure what the rest of assuming he assuming I outlive him, I'm not sure what the rest of his life looks like in terms of us. We don't really have much of a relationship, I would say. Mm. About. Four years ago, my parents and I had a pretty big falling out. And it was very sad. I'm sure it was very sad for them as well. It was very sad for me. They all had each other, and I was very much like on my own. And this was during COVID, but right before mm -hmm. COVID started. About three years, we went without seeing each other, talking to each other. I didn't get Christmas gifts for a couple of those years, or he didn't reach out my birthday or anything like that. And that's, I think, like the turning point for me. I've done so much work on myself that I do understand shame. I am mm -hmm. like, I see, I have so much empathy and I totally get what's going on. But on the same hand, it, I feel like I've spent a lot of, I know that I've been the bigger person in terms of repairing arguments and things like that when I was way younger. And I'm just fatigued by it. Not even fatigued, it's just me with being a leader at work my job is the leader and if something's wrong i need to be the one to mend it mm -hmm. i'm like giving up i see him once in a while but not we don't really have much of a relationship and i think i've made peace with that and it's sad but it's sad but on the same hand it's been so liberating just to stop i don't know i don't know what like the book would say on this exactly yeah. I just feel like I made so much peace by stop, by, by stop wishing things were different than they were. And I've literally spent like well over a hundred thousand dollars on healing, spent thousands of hours on chair ch and therapist chairs, read hundreds of books. Like yeah. I don't think he's even read one book about mm. or anything. And, mm. and 
but like on the same hand, if if he needed anything, like I'm, I'm, I'd be here for him. But that's the thing, like our family, and this was a generational thing. I think that my parents prepared for their retirements and their end of life care as well. So there won't be much need for me. I will never have to give them money or anything like that. They mm-hmm. Right. Um, it's interesting. My partner and I, we are starting our surrogacy journey. I'm not sure how much you know about it. It is incredibly mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. A privilege that we've been financially successful enough to afford it, but it's a down payment on a house, maybe yeah. in more areas. And it would be nice. I wish they would, it would, it would be nice if there was some help with that, but I'm just with the place a little bit where mm-hmm. I just think how they are and it's probably my biggest area of sadness though at the same time i mm-hmm. don't really the most authentic relationship my mom and i have gotten closer but there's a lot of that's on that's off the table i would say yeah and, um, she grew she's grown a lot like a lot but there's just still for me there's a, there's a lot of things that are just off the table i'm just not really willing to risk going there because it's been so unsafe mm-hmm. for so long and yeah, we'll see how things go. But I think that I'm a big fan of stoicism and I, I'm, I'm not exactly a hundred percent well-versed in this, but I think it could be said that at the base, at its most base form or most basic message of stoicism is really learn what you can control and what you can't. And there's so much freedom in that and every area of my life is it, I'm implementing that in every area of my life and controlling what I can and controlling what yeah. I can't. Yeah, no, for sure. Again, thank you for sharing that. And what I'm really hearing and you're in terms of the reference you made to stoicism as well is just having acceptance for what is right. And at the same time, to your point, in terms of what you can control, you've gone and sought out the help, tried to heal the past and, there's that aspect in terms of the relationship with your parents, specifically with your father, that you've tried all you can, but at the end of the day, that's all you can control. And I'm wondering, like, how much, what, like, when you, I'm assuming you came out to them and told them you're gay, how did that impact that relationship? Or the relationship was already fractured from childhood that this was just one more thing? Yeah. Just, I, I wanted to comment on the trying everything I can because I just, if anyone's listening and can learn from this, I think that's been a big part of this. I don't know that I've tried everything I can. Mm. And I think that's been probably the biggest area of confusion, guilt, shame on my end, and also peace, mm-hmm. maturity, and to make a decision on something. I think I've, I think that's what trauma does to you, you're like, I'm going to say something about this. I think that, I think I remember this big epiphany I had, like when I was taking the break from my family and, and I would just, and then ask myself hundreds of times, why don't, like, why, why doesn't someone who's been like viciously attacked, like, why don't, like, why do they stay with that person? And I never, and one day I, um, I got some validation from a very close person just in terms of what I remembered about my childhood. And I remember I was, they don't realize what they went through was abuse. And that really set the stage for me in terms of how I approach things. And I still think there's a lot for me to unpack about my, my, my childhood and outside the home. I don't want to. I think my home life was probably better than a lot of people's for sure. But it's really a symptom of just generational trauma that's not been healed. And we think that we can just bury it and it won't go anywhere. It goes somewhere. You're angry. You are unreasonable. You have your crap that you pick out in your family, the, what you're avoiding. And so I think that I just always, I always thought something was wrong with me. Oh. My dad and I can't get along the way that I see other dads getting along with their kids. And no, I'm not sure that I've done everything I can, but I think at this point I'm having to like 
take an educated guess. I hope I'm doing the right thing. And just, I think that, I think the ball's in his court, at least mm -hmm. in this. Yeah. And I can answer the gay question in a second. But yeah. I wanted... yeah, well, yeah, I do want to come back to that in terms of what do you feel like you can do further? I don't know at this point. I could keep trying. Oh, hey. mm -hmm. Do you want to try to have a conversation? And that might, that might end with a bigger fight. That mm -hmm. might end with me just holding in what I need to say. And it's not like that. I, I am like the least prideful person in the world. I can, so it's not about the cross. Literally, yeah. I couldn't have pride with this kind of stuff that yeah. I do. But uh, it's just, it hurts. In me, it's not that it even hurts. It's that me keeping it inside is, again, what I said. It's not going anywhere. So it's mm -hmm. just, I don't. So if an argument happens or something is said that I choose to not retaliate with or not react to, then I'm going to be spending time and money in therapy trying mm -hmm. to work through it that I'm just not sure. That mm -hmm. that I, or I'm going to be an asshole to my partner because mm -hmm. I because i'm bothered by right. something yeah so i think there, go ahead there's an aspect of worth too right like you shared and that's something you've had to work on and sometimes you have to set boundaries and recognize that to your point yes you can keep trying but at what cost to yourself right and then there's this other element of forgiveness and you can forgive the other person without having to talk about it too Right. And sometimes in order to get there, to forgive someone else, we have to forgive ourselves. And that's where that shame, that's where we get stuck to that. We're unable to forgive ourselves. And that's why it's so hard to let go and continue to go back that maybe if I can get this validation, then I feel like it's good. Yeah. I don't feel like that at all anymore. Mm -hmm. I forgive me. I forgive and truly, I don't have any animosity for childhood. I have some disappointment for now. Mm -hmm. Like these words came out when I was writing my book and it was like, I just always thought like there'd be a reward for being a compliant child for just like accepting the way things were. And now that there's my parents are retired, money is not a problem at all anymore. I just thought they'd be like, oh, like we're finally buying at the vacation home and we're going to do this now. And that's not coming. So it's a little bit like disappointing that there's not like more of an interest in my life, I would say, but uh, no, I think like my dad, mm -hmm. it's going to create, I'm 40 years old, starting a family and it's like, God, I couldn't imagine doing this 25 years old. I mean, you know, and it's weird because we're at an age right now where people are having it later and I am like, I'm fine. I still have the energy, but. I am really afraid, like people have dropped dead sometimes when they're 50. It doesn't really happen when they're 30. Right. I hope I don't drop dead, but like, on the other right. hand, like I'm so much smarter and more able to be a parent than I would have been 15 years ago. Yeah. So, Tick the good with the bad, but uh, yeah, I think that, I think I've definitely forgiven and just, I think, and I'm, it's probably one of the, I'm quite proud. I feel that in my heart, forgiving someone that doesn't ask for forgiveness is quite the, quite the, quite the accomplishment. I'm pretty proud of yeah. myself. But yeah. And it's a process. Like I remember, like somebody asked me, was there a point where this all clicked? No, there was not a point. Just one day you wake up and you're like, eh, this doesn't really bother me as much and then a year later you wake up again and you're like i don't really even think about this anymore and then a year after that it's i literally just think more yeah no fair enough yeah i do want to come back to the other question and see how that affected the relationship in terms of coming out and again was it always problematic and this added to it or have an effect my writing coach said this to me she's a heterosexual woman she's about my age and she 
and she went to school in New York and she said to me about two years into writing the book, she was like, Matt, she was like, I don't know that you've really acknowledged like how hard it is being gay. She's like, mm-hmm. a lot of gay friends, you know, growing up and like they, they really seem like they struggle. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. My being gay experience is very, been very interesting. I've been very proud gay person. I have probably hit it a little bit more than some, mm-hmm. not a lot, but a little bit more. I had a lot of straight friends in college and even in young adulthood, they were all accepting of me. It's really one of like, it's really been a proud thing for me that most of my straight friends, I was their first gay friend. And mm-hmm. it's also interesting. I had friends in college and I, they came and went more or less. And I still really am like my, mm-hmm. my core friends, most of them are just a couple of newer friends, but half of my core friends are people I've known for 20 years. And it, mm-hmm. you've seen like straight men, I have a lot of straight male friends and it's been like really beautiful to watch them like go from, I don't want to use the word tolerance, but for lack of a better word, tolerance <laughs> to go from tolerance to like total embrace and like almost, I don't know if I, I don't know if I want to say envy, but I think that there's a level of vulnerability that I have that I think that I've been right. able to help them learn to, to um, embrace of their own. I didn't tell it's being gay i didn't really come out until i was like 18 i probably started telling friends a few friends Mm -hmm. then i didn't tell my mom probably until 25 maybe around 25. my brother is gay as well he's younger he told my mom before i did and i told her she responded fine i never felt like i wasn't loved but she was religious and She's then not as religious. And I, I have compassion for the situation. I think that she did the best she could. And honestly, they, they didn't know anybody gay. So I don't really have, I never felt unloved. I never told my dad. I did, and it's weird. It's just, I just never did. And I'd love to know exactly what was going on in my 25 year old brain that prevented that. I. There was fear, I know, and when I, it's been brought up that he was disappointed about that, but it's, I have a lot, along with the forgiveness of him, I have a lot of forgiveness of myself and peace with it. I didn't tell him because he couldn't get along on, I was afraid of him. Mm. And I'm at, I'm, I'm a thousand percent at peace with that. And I wasn't, mm-hmm. and I was just like, we can't have a conversation about something way less serious. And I'm not putting my heart in a line here. Yeah. But, and was he disappointed with the fact that you didn't tell him or the fact that you came out? No, my dad's actually been totally supportive. Uh, he's, yeah. met, he's my dad, honestly, is totally fine. I feel like I don't think he ever had a problem with it at all there, which is kudos to him for that. Also, I have a lot of compassion for him, but no, yeah. I never felt anything from him. I just never talked to him about it. My mom, I think, had a harder time because of the religion piece. And it's it's so different now. And I live in L.A. I lived in L.A. and New York. And I don't. My partner reminds me that it's not like this everywhere. And it's yeah. really for me to believe. I believe it, but it's hard for me to, root, to think about that because it's just so embraced in New York and in, in California, but. Even compare apples to apples and growing up in California then or LA, like they're like being gay in school was not really okay. In college, I went to UC Riverside and there was like, still, I don't remember seeing hardly any gay people. I went to the gay club thing one time, not the gay dance club, like the gay um, community club thing one time. <laughs> there was like eight people or something out of a school that had, I don't know how many, there were probably like. 30,000 or 20 or 40, I don't know, something big. But now it's just, I think that people have, our parents, us as parents, like we've had so much exposure to it that it's just like second nature. And gay people were to be feared back then. And I think we all know now that 
I, I mean, I don't really see too many gay murderers on TV. I, that we're the, I don't think we're the, we're not the ones that are causing the problems in the world right now. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I would say that like my parents love my partner and everything. I don't feel anything like other than that, but I would just say that. I, I don't think, I think it would be, I think they would. I think it would be still easier for them if I was straight. I think they just don't, under, no one's ever really asked me like, Hey, this must've been hard for you. I've never gotten any sort of. Mm -hmm. Probably, um, just not thinking about it, but right. you know, I don't know. I'm a big reader. I buy a book when I'm wondering something. There's a lot of books out there that'll, um, provoke thoughts about what it's like for a gay kid. And I've talked to my gay friends now that are my, this was really one of my most riveting conversations. It was one of my best friends and him and I were talking about it and we were saying, we both got to the same point of, we only told our parents when we knew it was like, when we knew we didn't need them for anything, mm -hmm. enough to know that if they were like, don't ever come home, that we would be like, okay, we had, which is sad. And right. Like, I don't know if my mom listens to any of this stuff, but like, I mean, like, I mean, there's no anger. Like, I'm, I would love, this is, this has been my life. I know she doesn't want me to hurt ever. And I know that if she heard stuff like this, I think she would, I might think it would surprise her, but yeah, I mean, I would say that I'm definitely, I, I struggled with suicide and everything. And that shouldn't be the way that everybody, like the, the way that you feel for being marginalized. And right. Not just sexuality. Everyone who is marginalized feels mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, no, I, I agree. It, it is a tough spot and you're trying to make sense of so many things and it's hard to at times. But now that, as you've shared, you're starting your own family, what are some things that you're hoping to, through your own experience, share with the child that you guys are going to bring into the world and as a parent what are you hoping to accomplish and pay it forward in that sense um, that's a good question i don't mean to i'm let me clarify my reaction right now i'm saying that i think that this is probably going to be a lot harder than i imagine i think my partner and i have We've been in couples therapy for a very long time. Mm -hmm. We've done a lot of work on ourselves. We're also older. So I do think that we are pretty well prepared for things. I think we also understand this isn't going to be like, there's not, there's a lot of stuff that happened and we're having one child. My cousin, actually, it was a really good example. I was very close with her growing up and she wanted to have three or four kids. And then she had one and was really honest about it. And I, this is all I can handle. And she's a fantastic mom, but it was like, I'm my anxiety like this, I worry, like I just, so I think we're very aware of what we could handle. And like, I really want to be a dad and like to mm -hmm. do gas time and stuff like that. But I think we're both very aware that we do need another set of hands around the house sometimes mm -hmm. to help out. And if not, then we're just going to be arguing more, but we're very, we both work out. I'm okay working out a little less, but this stuff is all for mental health and for us to be cohesive. And I think there's just a lot less. I think that a lot of like what I see from families that struggle from things that have happened in my family, they're like but my family, there's so much, and it stems from my grandparents and their grandparents and their parents and everything. But it was like, there was so much martyrdom and so much. Mm -hmm everyone always having to take care of other people's feelings and other people's problems and, and no boundaries that were fair. My partner and I will say, if he comes home from work and if I'm like not able to talk, I'll say, I don't want to talk right now. And that's not a mean thing. He can tell me mm -hmm. that. I don't think that people do that very often. It's mm -hmm. oh, your partner. I don't want to hear about your work day. Right. And. I don't mean to say it like that. It's more yeah. like, hey, 
I have had my own day right now and I can't wait to have dinner with you in 20 minutes, but I am chilling out right now. And I think that we have the ability to really do that. But mm -hmm. you asked me this question originally, what really came to my mind first? And I've read, I'm a big Oprah fan and Oprah wrote a book a few years ago with Dr. Bruce Perry called What Happened to You. Yeah. And have you read that? Yeah. There was very, it was like the first book I found it recently and it highlighted all over. It was the first book I ever colored like that. But I think I'm very aware of what, and my partner read it too also. Just very aware that all of these things, fighting, all of this stuff, like your kids see it, your kids hear it. Mm -hmm. What stood up the first thing was like, apologize to your kids. I think Oprah says that. I think that was like a huge thing that she said a while ago. And it's just apologized. Glennon Doyle, she's an author. She's one of my favorite authors ever. I think she's a fantastic mom. She is not perfect, but she is like, you just, you just don't bury things. You apologize. You admit when you don't know what you're doing. You come back and you say, I'm sorry that I reacted this way. She has a drug and alcohol background when she was younger. Being honest with your kids about that stuff. And I look at like my history with alcohol and how I have definitely used more of it than I would like to have used it. I, it's funny. I never knew it was bad for my health. Hmm. I realized that, but it was like shame. And my, my parents story was. They both grew up with alcoholic parents of some variation, mm -hmm. but my, my, my parents did not drink at all. So they, re they really skipped that, which was a huge blessing. So that was really nice that they skipped that, but they made me feel like the only reason why you don't drink is because it's bad or something. And I guess I never really knew like college when I was taking shots all the time. Like that was like harming me. I guess I, maybe I thought my liver or something, but it's like, it's your heart, it's your brain, it's your lungs. It's all of this. Right. And I think like teaching, just being honest with your kids and, and but I think a big thing is like the overwhelm and just like the, like, like for us, like we live in Los Angeles, we have a very expensive house payment and I still have, I still struggle with the scarcity issue yeah. with get scarcity and just worrying about money. It's so much better than it's ever been, but we're literally just deciding to pull the trigger on this surrogacy thing right now. And one of the condolences we really had to make to like, so I, or I guess I said it more in charge of our financial, like we're worrying about it, I guess I'm the yeah. warrior. And like worst comes to worst, like we've been moved to a different state. I love California taxes here are very high and cool with it more or less, but if things got really bad, I mean, we would have to move somewhere. And yeah. Like yeah. It's hmm. solution to problems. It's not, it's not, it's not so rigid. Like that's gonna be like, we'll figure it out. Yeah. And you touched on apologizing to children. And I think there's many layers to it with respect to that, because I've talked about that as me being a father too. First of all, you're creating an avenue for your child to then be able to express themselves. If they feel like they don't agree with something, they feel like, okay, if I'm going to share that with my parent, my parents not gonna get defensive because they're open to the feedback. So that's one aspect of it. Then the second thing is you're also role modeling for them that it's okay to make mistakes. We all make mistakes. I remember growing up and it sounds like you had somewhat a similar experience where you look at your parents and they put on this persona that they're not allowed to make mistakes. And if you try to point it out, then you're in trouble. There's that one layer too. And also your role modeling for your children that when you do make mistakes, you can apologize and move on from it. Right. And it's not one of those things where it's the the big elephant in the room that you don't talk about. And that's how I felt at times as a child too. And then I guess one last question in terms of parenting compared to a heterosexual couple, do you foresee any other challenges with being parents? And is that something you guys have talked about or even 
Uh, I know it's one of those things you can get into it when it starts, but yeah, I'm just curious if that's something you've thought about. It's so funny. I think sexuality right now, I don't even understand sexuality yeah. right now. There's <laughs> a lot going on in the world with identity and sexuality, yeah. and I don't know that anybody really has this figured out or yeah. knows what they want, and I'm not saying that in a derogatory way at all. People are expressing themselves in ways that we've never seen, and this is happening yeah. very... And I have like straight male friends that are wearing nail polish. I have, I mean, it's just that we're like, that would never have happened. Like probably right. literally was five years ago, like a straight male would have never put nail polish on. Like it just, so to answer your question, I'm sure that there will, I'm sure that there will be obstacles, but I see sexuality in general, just being an obstacle and not a bad obstacle, a learning let me rephrase that. I see sexuality being a situation we are all having to yep. uh, grow and adapt to and learn, just continuous learning as time goes on. Who knows? Like, interesting. Like, in 30 years right now, will the majority of people not be monogamous? Will the majority of people be gay? Will the majority of people be polyamorous? We, we, we literally don't. Right now, I think the one thing we can say for sure is that... Uh, sexuality is probably way different today than we ever would have thought it would be. Absolutely. Yeah. I don't know. Well, we'll see. but I did want to just say one more thing about the um, apologizing thing, because we both read the Dr. Yeah. Ruth Marie Oprah book. It was, I think that the thing that really floored me was they were, where they talked about respect, like respecting your kid. That was really new for me. And I think it was probably, I don't think that kids were respected until this generation right now, ever. I'm sure you grew up hearing something similar. Of, I'm an adult. You respect me. Yeah. I struggle with that word respect, like not even just with parents, but even in, even in business that it, I think respect needs to be earned. I would think there's a general thing. I'm not going to tell somebody above me to screw off, but I wouldn't mm -hmm. tell want me to do that either, honestly. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, I wouldn't tell anybody to do that. I guess if, I just heard myself say that. And yeah, I wouldn't tell them above me or below me to do that. And I don't really, if anything, I have a more authentic relationship with people at work that are below me than people that are above mm -hmm. me. People that are above me are like me and vulnerable mm -hmm. and didn't take me back. But a lot of time respect is like just you're telling someone what they want to hear and mm -hmm. not have a conflict. Not, I'm not healthy. That's what I need to do. I'm a mature person and yeah. it's, it's, it's getting in the way of authenticity. Yeah. And I think what you're referring to and often growing up, it felt like there was a hierarchy system in, in the house and what we really need to do as parents or adults is treat children as equals and not create that hierarchical system. And that's where they, again, they feel seen and heard. Otherwise they feel like, okay, I'm to be compliant or submissive and just do what, as I'm told, and that's not healthy for the child's development in the long run. And, yeah. and we see these issues as children grow up and they become adults, they, they struggle in their adult relationships because they don't have that confidence or the ability to express themselves. Well, with rules, I think mm -hmm. Brene Brown or somebody like would say something like, you do have to explain that I am the parent, I'm mm -hmm. looking out for you. There are going to be times that you're not going to be happy with Jen, but I think, I hope that if you can just always start from the very beginning of having a respectful, even keeled demeanor when you're talking with your child, I would hope that goes pretty far. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the overwhelm is a big problem. I think that, I think, uh, and I'm not saying that overwhelm doesn't happen, but overwhelm, if you and I get into an argument right now, because I've over, I'm overwhelmed. And you're, and I'm above you in life or family, whatever it might be. You're gonna, you're gonna walk away like we're not thinking that I, thinking that you're doing something wrong. It's, it's, it's eating away at you, or you're gonna. It's just the, the, the balance is not happening, right? It's a two-way relationship. Maybe just, maybe it's better to say more two-way than even, than on, than on the level field because Correct. I do, I'm like you get to have rules. Absolutely. Yeah. But it, you have to have that avenue where they can 
speak about the rules too, right? If they feel that something's unfair, they should be able to at least express themselves. And then it's a conversation rather than thou shall follow this. <laughs> totally. <laughs> yeah. Matt, this has been a great conversation. Thank you again for being so vulnerable and open about your story. Is there anything else you feel like we haven't touched on that would be of value to the listeners or that you would like to, to talk about and, and share? Honestly, I think we've had a really enjoyable and full encompassing conversation. So I don't think there's anything in terms of the topic that we've missed. Yeah, I appreciate that. And if listeners want to get a hold of you or find some of your work, especially if you're writing, what are some ways they can do that? Uh, I know you wanted to share some resources as well. Yeah, uh, my website is mattgarlach.com. It's M-A-T-G-E-R-L-A-C-H. I do a weekly blog and I have something coming soon where I'm creating this pamphlet, this document, this workbook that is going to teach you exactly what I've learned about goal setting and going after my life, admitting what I've needed to admit about my past. So feel free to email me directly at matt at mattgerlach.com and I'll send that over to you when it's ready in a few days. I'd love to just keep in touch. And I offer one-on-one -on -one coaching right now. There'll be some group offerings coming soon, but I'm really an open book. And uh, throw some time on my calendar. There's a link on my website to do that. No expectations. Would love to just chat with you and hear if there's anything that's going on that I might be able to be a resource for. Yeah, would love yeah. to just stay connected with anybody who's inspired, curious, or that I can help. For sure. Yeah, we'll throw all that in the show notes. But uh, Matt, thank you again. It was a pleasure talking to you and got a lot to learn about your life and what you've come through. So I appreciate all that. Thank you. You too. Thank you for checking out this episode with Matt. As always, please subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube. That's the best and easiest way to support this podcast. And on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, you can leave us up to a five-star review. Also, check out evergreenpodcast.com for their network of podcasts, including Easy Conversations and the sponsors in the description. And finally, please feel free to subscribe to the Easy Reflections newsletter, a weekly newsletter that goes out where I summarize these podcast episodes and reflect on different mental health topics that I'm thinking about. Thank you again, and until next week.